Hello, and I thought I'd do something a little bit different this week. I'm going to do a code review of a project that I worked on towards the end of last year, and it was a platform game called Saving Sedit. To celebrate the growth of the YouTube channel, I thought it would be fun to have a code jam. Now, if you're not familiar with a jam, it's where a bunch of coders get together uh, to code something in relation to a theme, and there are usually a few rules. So we had the One Lone Coder Code Jam 2018, and the theme was Discovery. There weren't really many rules, you could use any language and you could use any game engine or anything at all, it didn't even have to be a game, so long as it could be interpreted by the public as adhering to the theme of discovery. And the one thing that jams have in common is there is a time limit, and for this jam you only had seven days to create something and submit it for public review. It's quite an exciting thing, because people knew the jam was going to happen, but they didn't know what the theme was going to be, so they can't prepare any code in advance. And that's really what the competition is about. How can you make the best use of the short amount of time that you've got to create something that demonstrates the theme discovery? And for the first One Lone Coder Jam, it went very well. We had 18 entries, some were very sophisticated, some were very funny, and others were quite basic. And I was really pleased that we managed to get entries from all different abilities and all different styles of programming. And if you're interested in seeing the other entries, you can pop along to my second channel, Javidex9 Extra, where you can see me play through all of the entries. Now, because I was hosting the jam, and I knew the theme in advance, it wasn't very fair for me to enter. But the community twisted my arm and said, I should have a go anyway. And I thought, why not? I like challenge-based coding. And I'd only just released the Pixel Game Engine, so I really wanted a, a demonstration vehicle to show that it can be used as a genuine game engine. And so I created the platform game Saving Sedit. I thought it would be quite an interesting video to look at some of the design decisions that went into creating this game. Because of the limited time and resources available, Sometimes I didn't always get it right, so it'd be interesting to look at what went right, what went wrong, and what I would change. But I thought I'd start this video with just a little introductory gameplay session. The game features a lot of in-jokes based on community members of the Discord server, and Sedit is one of the moderators, and he doesn't have very much luck when it comes to computers. And as the story suggests, Sedit's computer has crashed, and as typical of Sedit, he decides to reinstall his operating system but he's lost all of his operating system install disks, so he needs Magetsub's help to find them. Magetsub being another prominent member of the Discord community. The objective of the game is to explore the level and discover where the operating system disks are, but also to find some keys to unlock the exit. There are some other things, but I'll talk about those as we get playing. Interestingly, I decided to write this game to work with both the keyboard and joypad input. To start the game, you can choose a particular level to play, and the size of the level, because all of the levels in Saving Sedit are procedurally generated. But by choosing these two numbers and keeping them consistent, you can generate the same level each time you play. And this was an appealing feature for me, because I'm quite into speedrunning. And I liked the idea of creating a game where the level and the placement of the collectibles was predictable, so you could really learn the optimal route to get through the level as fast as possible and it will even time you as you're playing. So let's start. And as you can see straight away, unlike most pixel game engine games, it's quite a sophisticated one. We've got an animated character, vibrant graphics, and background music playing. You will hear the background music chop up as I edit this video, uh, there's not a great deal I can do about that. But you can press left and right and the character moves around. The character has a nice mass to it, and one of the things we'll look at is how did I get the character to feel the way I wanted it to feel. But a level has been generated for us, and it's time to start exploring. So we can collect operating system disks, and we can jump by pressing the spacebar. We see we get nice little animations for falling and jumping. But one of the dynamics I wanted to capture was the ability to wall jump. And this requires a little bit of skill, because you've got a very minimal window in which to execute the wall jump. Anyway, let's keep exploring. So I just picked up a friend token, and as you can see the screen has changed its appearance. In fact, this time we picked up a Sedit token, so Sedit is helping me write some code. And when Sedit writes code, well, sometimes it works, but it doesn't always work quite as well as you'd expect. And we can see here uh, these GitHub icons, these represent more friends tokens. So if we collect one of these, we'll see how are they going to patch the game in order to help me find the exit. 
Well here we've picked up Ugly Swedish Fishes token uh, and you can see it's gone a little bit dotty and wavy and noisy and that's because Fish believes in path tracing and I'll show you a little clip of that in a minute. Uh, here's another friend. Uh, this one is Gorbit so whenever Gorbit posts a gif to the Discord server it's undoubtedly going to be corrupted so we can see we've got uh, some artifacts in the video game image here. Now whenever you pick up a friend token uh, it slows down the clock at the top of the screen. And the idea is to get to the exit as fast as possible, or in the lowest amount of time. So I wanted the movement to be quite fluid. That chime says we've just picked up a YouTube Programmer Helper token. And we'll use that in a minute. Oh, now we've just picked up a Brank token. And Brank's a very good coder, but sometimes his code just makes things a little bit more difficult than they need to be. So this is a bit more of a, a punishment pickup. But what was quite nice is the Pixel Game Engine is generating all of these effects and running at quite a healthy frame rate, so I was very pleased with this outcome. In the bottom left hand corner you can see a small mini map, uh, which is being uncovered as we explore the level. I'm going to go down here. The jumping does actually require quite a bit of skill and timing to get right. Something which I hoped would appeal to those that do want to speedrun this game. Ah, there we can see the exit, but I need to collect four keys before the exit opens, and unfortunately here is one. All of the items are randomly placed within the level. So I've got my first key. Here we can see another YouTuber helper token. We can call upon YouTubers to help us when we think we're getting stuck. So if I press the H key, this is going to use up the Hobson token. And Hobson is a YouTuber well known for creating Minecraft in short periods of time. So the world has changed to a Minecraft theme. And you can in fact mine the blocks out of the way to help you out. Or hinder you. When you've selected a YouTuber to help you, it only lasts for a few seconds. Now again to appeal to the speedrunners, uh, the collecting of the discs is somewhat optional. Uh, but those that like to complete the games 100% might like to try and explore the whole level as optimally as possible. To find all of the discs and achieve that 100% goal. So I've picked up now four Javid tokens. And I consider myself to be a rather helpful YouTuber. Uh, so I'm going to use Javid token now, and we can see that the screen has changed into something that looks like the console. But in the background, we've got arrows. I can't change the level here, but the arrows indicate where the next useful pickup is. So in this case, hopefully, it's going to be some keys. So I'm just going to follow the arrows and try and navigate the labyrinth. I must confess, I'm playing on the keyboard, which does require a little bit more skill than playing with a controller. <laughs> now this level is quite a small one uh, in comparison, so it shouldn't take too long to complete. There we go, it pointed us to a key, and the arrows have all changed direction now. Once the YouTube helper token has run out, it goes back uh, into this neon pink retro future world. Uh, I'm going to use another Javid token so I can find the key and then get to the exit. So I foresee that when people have learnt the level layout a little bit, you could actually move around very quickly here. Now there's a bug, and this is one of the things you'll see in jams, is that you don't always get everything quite right. So we can see the key is on the exit, but however it won't actually exit the game. The exit is where we originally saw it. Come on, Javid, get up this column. There we go. Right, use my one last helper token. Hopefully go and find the exit. Now you can hear a little pip each time I collect with the wall. That's the duration you've got uh, to jump in the opposite direction to achieve a wall jump. See the exit down there. Now if I add some more Hobson tokens, 
I could uh, just knock a hole through the wall and reach the exit. So using up the tokens at the right time is quite a valuable strategy. And here we are at the exit, so let's end the game. Oh, jump past the exit, come on. There we go. And even though I've been recording and there's been a few cuts here, that one took me 8 minutes and 35 to get to the end, and I found 48 of the operating system discs. And that was on the smallest level. We can just go and play again, or change the level and try a new one. So let's take a look at the code. And it of course uses the Pixel Game Engine, and all of the code above here is a single file solution, uh, is a class that extends from the Pixel Game Engine, and this is the main function where I construct it, uh, and I'm creating quite a high resolution window in this case. Those familiar with the Pixel Game Engine will know that we need to override two functions, onUserCreate and onUserUpdate. And here is the onUserUpdate, and there's not very much in it. Uh, I decided to break the game up into states so I could manage them a little bit easier. So onUserUpdate simply looks at what state is the game in and calls the corresponding function, passing along f elapsed time. Encapsulating like this allows me to put in hard boundaries between the different game states, so my code doesn't become jumbled up with components for the platforming action in the title screen, for example. And there are not too many states, so the first state the game will go into is one called loading, and that will load the resources, and it turned out that that was quite a headache. Once everything's loaded, it goes to the title screen, and in the title screen it can then go to displaying the story or displaying the credits. And when you exit from the story or credit state, you go back to the title screen. When you select start on the title screen, you go to the generate state. And that's where it'll procedurally generate the level and populate it with items. Once generation is completed, it goes into main. And that's really the fundamental game state. That's where the platforming action and all of the game dynamics are implemented. Once you reach the exit and have a sufficient amount of keys, the game will go into the complete state. And will display the score and end results to the player. Now, in my jam, I did allow people to use code they'd already written. And I felt, for me, this was quite a necessary thing, because I've produced quite a few videos with lots of interesting algorithms. Uh, so the first code that I stole from myself was the Code It Yourself platformer game. And if we go into the main game state, we can see that exactly the same code exists. So this is controlling the player based upon either, in this case, controller input or keyboard input, and it controls their velocity and the direction they're facing and works out whether the player is on the ground, all topics that we covered in that video. Pressing the space key allows the player to jump, but they can only jump if the player is on the ground. If they are on the ground, we set their vertical velocity to shoot them up the screen. And in this case, I'm using the sound pegex, uh, the Pixel Game Engine extension, to play a sound of jumping. To implement wall jumping, I set a flag based on whether the player is touching the wall. And if they are touching the wall, I set this time to jump variable to a fixed value. And this will give you a small window of opportunity to jump again. This means we can work out if a wall jump is a viable option. Because if we're within that time window, we can check to see if the player is holding down the opposite button to the direction they're moving. And if they are, we can jump again by setting the Y velocity and play the sound clip again. The process repeats itself, so next time you collide with a wall, hopefully on the opposite side, the timer gets reset, so you have another 100 milliseconds to change direction and jump again. And this allows you to wall climb through the labyrinth. And so other than adding the facility to double jump, the platforming code itself is no different to the Code It Yourself platformer game, which included all of the collision code on a tile map. Tile maps are something we've used many times on the channel. Essentially, they're a 2D array of information, and each cell of that array describes what that cell should look like on the screen. And typically I've always implemented tile maps just as that, a 2D array, of Boolean values. So 1, where there is something you can collide with, and 0, where there is empty space. In general, I realised that for a lot of videos, and for this project, I'm using tile maps quite a lot. And so I decided to abstract the tile map as a class. Because I'm never going to be sure precisely what the cells in my tile map are going to contain, I created a template class that allowed me to just create a 2D array of something in particular. And in this case, that something in particular is a class called Basic Tile, which really only has two important features, an ID and a flag that says whether it exists or not. You'll notice here that I've got additional information, edge ID and edge exist, 
and that's because I got a bit carried away and wasted some time in the jam, thinking I should make the most perfect tile map class ever. And I'd just done my video on shadow casting. And shadow casting involved creating maps, or tile maps, uh, out of these binary blocks, but then it required uh, to calculate and extract the edges in order to cast the shadows. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be really cool if we had all of this functionality built into the tile map too? However, it didn't make it to the end product. I made the decision that a tile map should be responsible for drawing itself, based on some camera properties. So the whole map exists and the camera indexes into a particular 2D location within the map and gets drawn, depending on the size of the cells and the width of the screen, etc. So this draw layer function takes in a reference to the layer that contains the tile information and it also takes in a reference to a new object called an atlas. An atlas is just a large sprite and this large sprite might contain lots of individual images that are all slightly different. For example, this might represent animation, or it might be broken up into representing the collectibles. The idea being that all of the information is kept in one place, because when you're editing the images in your art package, sometimes it's more convenient that everything is next to each other. However, in order to extract information from an atlas sprite like this, you need to specify a region. This means the atlas is really a data structure that contains a whole bunch of elements. And these elements consist of an x and y coordinate, which is some location within the atlas, and a width and a height. By associating all of these atlas entries with an ID, when combined with the tile map and when being drawn, we can take the ID to give us the required location within the large sprite containing all of the images and to just draw that sub sprite or partial sprite. And this is exactly what I do when I'm drawing the levels because each cell in my level is a boolean, but also an ID. Let me show you what I mean. Here we can see part of the map is drawn, and some of the cells represent solid objects, so the player can't walk through them, and can jump from them. But what we can also see is that the cells aren't all the same. This cell up here, for example, has blue borders, on two sides, in a corner. But the cells next to it have blue borders along the tops and the bottoms. They're actually different graphics depending on the configuration of the cell and its neighbours. So this implies that each of my cells has a unique identifier, which we can use to look up in the atlas to get the coordinates and width and height of a particular area of a larger image to display in the location of that cell. The graphical effect I was going for was that there would be a nice continuous edge around all groups of cells. Now, I could have done this programmatically by taking each cell in turn and evaluating its neighbours and choosing the appropriate texture. And this means in my art package, I'd go away and generate cells of every possible combination of edge. But this actually gets to be quite a large number very quickly. And it gets worse when you consider that I wanted the blue glow to nicely flow around the inside corners. So then you need cells that also have corners drawn in as well. I tried to be clever, and rather than have a big chunk of code which goes through every possibility and chooses the correct cell, I wanted the layout of my tile map to be conveniently indexable by the program. And so I constructed the following. I know that the cell in the middle can be decided based on the cells surrounding it. I make an assumption that the cell in the middle always exists. Because if there is no cell there, I don't care what the neighbours are, I don't need to look at them. And I numbered the neighbours as such. Conveniently, there are eight neighbours. And this means there are 256 possibilities of configuration in this small matrix. And what I'm going to do is look to see whether a cell exists or not and use the index of that cell to construct an 8-bit binary number. So for this section of the map, I've got three cells set to solid. I know the middle one is set, but then I've also got 2 to the power 0 plus 2 to the power 3, which is equal to 9. Going through all the values from 0 to 255 will give me every permutation of cells, as we effectively binary count around the periphery. And then I set to work in my art package. Here you can see 3x3 three three pixels with the centre one set to pink. As I move to the next 3x3 three three pixels, 
we can see the centre one set to pink and one in position zero set to one. Move along, position one gets set to one and zero gets set to zero. And we can see it binary count as we move along the top of the image. And I did this for all of them. It was really therapeutic. Once I'd done it on a per pixel level, I inflated the image so that each square was 64 by 64 pixels, and then used the effects layers to colour in the blue border for me. In my game, I know that many of these options are never going to show up. All of the walls in Saving Sedit are always one cell wide. But why have I gone to all of this trouble? Let's examine this configuration of solid cells. So we've got 2 to the 0 plus 2 to the 3 plus 2 to the 7, and that equals 137. My tile map consists of 3 by 3 regions, but it consists of 16 of them across and 16 of them down. So I can turn this 137 into an X and Y coordinate in my giant sprite sheet. I can work out how far along in the sheet by doing 137 mod the width, 16, which is 9. And I can work out how far down by doing 137 integer divide by the width, which is 8. So by examining which of my neighbours are active and which aren't, I can calculate an index which I can turn into a 2D index to then extract the correct cell from my sprite sheet. So let's start in the top corner. We said it was 8 down and 9 across. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And surprise, surprise, we can find the shape. And if I zoom in, I know I can extract the centre of that shape and it will be perfectly aligned with the neighbours in the final tile map. I thought this was a fun exercise in designing the assets in such a way that the tools can make them very easy to modify because I can use the effects to change all sorts of properties about how I want the game to look and consistently rather than having to handcraft the graphics. Going back to the code we can see how I now compose the scene. The first thing I do is draw a background image, depending on which character is currently helping you out. So for Magetsub, it's the default uh, sunset background with the pink and blue tiles. And I call my draw layer function, passing in the tile map and the atlas that we've just seen. This function in itself is quite simple. It takes in where the camera is, the tile map and the atlas, and draws the specific tile for that location. In the main source file, I have this create border map function which does exactly the process I've just described. It goes through all of the cells in the tile map and checks their neighbours to construct uh, an 8-bit integer and then works out the x and y coordinates of a particular location in the sprite sheet. And I thought that was quite nifty, that the cell's ID contains enough information to extract the location of the required sprite from the sprite sheet. To procedurally generate the levels, I just cut and paste my code from my maze generation algorithm video. This performs a breadth first search to generate labyrinths, and as you can see it's populating a 2D array of space and walls. Perfect. It also guarantees that every location is reachable from every other location, so the player can't get trapped in a loop and not reach the exit later on. And this also guarantees that all collectibles are also collectible. The code for this occurs in the create maze function, and this really is a cut and paste from that video. I take the boolean array output of that algorithm and then feed it into my algorithm to create the indices for the tiles. You can tell this is jam code because I've left all sorts of debug stopping points in there. So here I am creating the maze, which gives me a boolean array. I also take advantage of this opportunity to create the minimap, which is just a sprite, the same dimensions as the array of the maze. And here I create three layers. These layers are all tile maps themselves. The first is the one we've been talking about, the level. The second layer contains all of the collectibles. And the third layer is used when the Javid YouTube token is in effect. And we'll come back to that later. I convert my Boolean array into meaningful cells for the game. Then I call my create border map function, which turns the Booleans into indices so we can access the correct locations of the texture and then I randomly add drops to the game. 
I use rand in this case because the seed has been set by the number chosen by the player at the start, guaranteeing that the same sequence of random numbers will be drawn each time rand is chosen. This will allow you to uh, use the same level on different computers and players can compete against each other in a fair way. Placing collectibles is just quite brute force. If the cell is occupied, then it just goes and chooses another one until it finds a cell that it can place the object in. And it's got to place so many of each object. So it's got to place a uh, hundred discs in this case, it's got to place a bunch of keys, and it's got to place an exit and some tokens uh, for the YouTubers. All of the collectibles are placed into the collectible layer. Once the level is generated, the game state is changed to main. And I also start playing the background music using the sound peg X, but I've disabled it just for making this video. The player, called Magetsub, is animated. As you can see, he bobbles about as he walks. And he can jump, and when he falls, he has a foot facing in the right direction. He also faces the direction he's moving in. I've not covered sprite animation on the channel before, but really there's nothing to it. I just have a bunch of images which I scroll through in time. And I choose which bunch of images depending upon the state of the player. Because I'm rubbish at drawing, I went along to Humble Bundle and purchased a nice game developer resources pack, which consists of loads of sprites of lots of interesting characters. And they're all categorised into specific animations, and so each PNG file represents a particular frame of that animation. Purchasing the pack also gave me a licence to distribute the artwork. But as we'll see later on, I had second thoughts about this. To handle the animations and the storage of all of these different images, I created an animator class, which fundamentally was a map, um, mapping strings to a vector of sprites. The string would represent the current state of the sprite, for example, running, falling, shooting, etc. And the vector would consist of all of the frames for that particular animation. At any given time, I can simply change the state of the sprite by passing on a new string, and every frame for this particular animator class, I would increase the frame counter based on the accumulation of F elapsed time. Now, because F elapsed time can be very small because of high frame rates, I wanted this to look sensible, so I had to choose a value which animated quite nicely. And it worked out that 100 milliseconds per frame seemed about right on screen. My on-screen player sprite is responsible for drawing itself, so I pass to the animator class a pointer to the pixel game engine so it can draw itself. Uh, it also uses the graphics 2D extension to transform and scale the sprite accordingly, because the sprites that I'm supplied with were quite detailed and large, far too large for the 64 by 64 pixel cells I'm showing in the world. And I can choose the correct image to show based on the state of the sprite and the current frame. Depending on the circumstances of the player, I can change the state of the sprite. And so here, if the player is on the ground, and the player is not moving left or right, so its x velocity uh, is approximately zero, then I want to be in the idle state. So I change my animator class to set up the idle state. If I'm not idle, then I'm walking or running, so I change it to the run state. Likewise, I can distinguish between the jumping and falling states based on my Y velocity being less than zero. If it is less than zero, then I'm jumping. Because don't forget, a negative Y velocity will move up the screen. Whilst I'm here, we'll just quickly look at how I handle the collectibles. Uh, the collectibles all occupy a full cell, and I check that the middle of the player sprite has entered that cell before adding the collectible and incrementing the appropriate collectible counter. And the game logic is also implemented here, it's quite simple. If we've hit the exit uh, cell, and if I have found four keys, then I can move to the game complete state. Each time I collect something, I remove it from my collectible layer. I just set the cell ID for that layer to zero and tell it it doesn't exist anymore, just to be doubly sure. And I play a small sound effect, because it's good to reward the player with these audible tones. The YouTube collectible tokens are exactly the same as any other token, you collect them and store them, so it just increases a counter. So that applies to both Javid and Hopson tokens. However, helper tokens are a little bit different. They have an immediate effect that they need to apply to the game. Whilst the game is running, time is accumulating. That's how I'm monitoring how long it's taking the player to complete the level. 
But when you've got a friend in effect, the timer slows down. So I have a variable game time multiplier, which is multiplied by f elapsed time to slow down that clock. Normally, this is one. But on contact with a helper token, a particular rendering effect is applied to the game. And there's four to choose from. The duration of these effects is always set to 10 seconds. If there are no effects in place, then we're running in normal mode. And here we can see the game time multiplier set to one. Underneath that, the collision detection code is exactly the same as that used in the platform game. When we picked up YouTube player tokens, such as the Hopson token which turned it into a Minecraft world, and the Javid token that turned it into a console world, we don't actually have to do very much to change the game. All we need to do is provide a different atlas when we draw the world. The structure and layout of the world hasn't changed, just the graphics have, so we'll provide a different sprite sheet for the background of that atlas and just render as normal. We'll see in Javid mode we have this third layer which I mentioned earlier, which displays the arrows in the background that help you work out where the next fundamental collectible is. Once we've drawn the world appropriately, we draw the player. Then after drawing the player, we draw all of the user information on the screen, such as the score and the time and how many things they've collected. I draw everything twice because I draw it with a shadow in the background, just to make it stand out, because the background regions are of both light colours and dark colours. Adding a shadow ensures that the player can always see, no matter what the background is. If you have picked up a helper, a different rendering effect is applied to the game. Now, in all of my videos so far, whenever we've used the Pixel Game Engine, we've just drawn to the screen. However, in the main game state, before we start drawing anything, you'll see that I do a call to set draw target. And this allows me to render off screen to a sprite called back buff, which represents the back buffer. And this means all subsequent draw calls from the Pixel Game Engine don't go to the screen, they go to this target sprite instead. And at the end, if there are no effects in place, I can simply draw this back buffer to the screen. But if there are effects in place, I can draw this back buffer to the screen and distort it in interesting ways at the same time. Ugly Swedish Fish that helps you created Fishcraft as his OLC Jam entry, which is a clone of Minecraft, but it uses a path tracing engine. It's very clever and looks very pretty, but you can see you get this sparkly noise effect because he can't draw all of the pixels per frame in real time. There's quite a lot of maths going behind the rays bouncing around. And so I thought it would be fun to emulate this effect whenever he's helping you out in the game. And I can achieve this very simply. Because all of my screen is in a back buffer, I can just selectively choose random pixels of that back buffer to display to the screen, or the front buffer. And so that's exactly what I do. The effect is quite compelling. Any change uh, between successive back buffers uh, gets filled up with these random sparkles, and that's because we're just randomly choosing pixels to, from the back buffer to the front buffer. Gorbit's effect tries to emulate corrupted GIFs, and this happens in exactly the same way, but rather than choosing random pixels, I choose random square regions of the back buffer to transfer over to the front buffer. Because there's more content in a region, I actually do less of those per frame. And here we can see a Gorbit token in action. So even though it's the same effect mechanically, it does look visually quite different. The Sedit effect is a little bit unique in that it uses another feature I've not described in any videos uh, where you can actually specify a pixel shader in the Pixel Game Engine. And you might be thinking, a pixel shader? Surely not. Well, yes, it is quite a simple pixel shader, uh, but what it allows you to do is take the location of a pixel, a source pixel and a destination pixel, and blend them and distort them accordingly. And it will affect every subsequent draw call. So the Sedit effect tries to achieve everything kind of working, but just not looking quite right. And I do that by taking every alternate row on the screen and saturating the colours a little bit, just to distort them. And here we can see the Sedit effect kind of looks like a broken old television from the 80s. The final effect is the Brank effect, and it's designed to be a little bit of a hindrance. What I do is draw the back buffer to the front buffer, but I offset everything by half the screen high and half the screen wide. As you can see, the final effect is quite disorientating. 
should point out now, Brank is quite a professional programmer. And I quite liked that just with some simple pixel manipulation, you can achieve a diverse range of effects. All of the resources for the game are loaded in the loading state. And the reason I don't do this on, on user create is that I can display a message on the screen to inform the player that the game is loading. It might take a different amount of time. And it takes a while because there are 81 different resources to load for this game. You've got all of the player animations, you've got the sound effects, you've got the background images, etc, etc. And it was once I started really throwing resources at the game I noticed there was a problem. It was taking a long time to load. And it was taking a long time to load because the resources are PNG files. And on Windows, on the Pixel Game Engine, uh, they need to be converted into the OLC sprite format. And this takes a bit of time. To attempt to reduce the loading times, I created a function in the Pixel Game Engine called Save to PGE SPR File which takes just the sprite and its raw data, so no compression at all, and dumps it to a file, along with its width and its height. The idea being is that this will load much faster. And indeed it did, at the expense of taking up more disk space to store the resource. They're no longer PNGs, they're effectively 32-bit bitmaps. And here are all the OLC sprite files for the game. There's quite a few of them. And because they are bitmaps, some of these files are very large indeed. This one contains all of the tile maps that we saw earlier. And it's 64 megabytes in size now because it's a bitmap. And this struck me with a bit of a problem. There's no way I'm going to be able to distribute this game for the jam. But I also knew that these files would compress very highly. That 64 megabytes has just gone down to just under 500 kilobytes. Because the data inside them is quite simple. I also wasn't very keen on having all of the files accessible to the user. I was a little unsure about the license for the Humble Bundle that I'd bought. Turns out it's okay, but at the time I was a bit unsure about sending out these images, because people could quite easily turn these into bitmaps, and use them for themselves. And so I added yet another feature I've not talked about on the Pixel Game Engine, resource packs. And this turned out Probably to be a big mistake, because by far this was the most time-consuming part of the entire project. What I wanted to try and do was emulate a disk system in memory. So all of my resource files would be stored in a single file which is loaded into RAM at the start of the program. And then you access that memory as if it's a file system. So I didn't have to go and rewrite all of my functions for loading sprites i.e. I wanted to be able to store anything in a resource pack and make it look like a file to the rest of the C++ programming environment, even though it wasn't, it was just something stored in memory. A resource pack consists of a map of entries, and the key value of the map is the file path, and the entry is a memory structure that identifies where the file starts and ends within a larger pool of memory. Of course I also needed utility functions in order to create the resource pack. At first the resource pack is empty, and you add to the pack files, at which point the function opens the files, works out the size of it, creates an entry, allocates the memory for the file, copies the file into that memory, closes the file, and adds the entry to the map. To save the resource pack to disk, so you just have one big file containing all of your resources in a virtual file system, the first thing I'll need to do is write the map. So I have to iterate through all of the entries in the map and store that information in the file. So the file sizes, its position, what it's called, and other properties that describe the file. Once I've written the map to the resource pack, I then write the data for the individual files in the resource pack to the output file. But this presents a problem, because even though I know the sizes of the individual files, I don't know where they're going to be in the output file, because the file offset position of a file in my output resource pack depends on the size of the map to begin with. So the first time I write the map to the file, it's really just a dummy map to make sure I've used up the right number of bytes to store it. Then I can write the file data individually and get the offsets required to then go and rewrite the map back at the start of the file with the correct offsets in it. Of course, once you've saved the resource pack, you then need a function to load the resource pack. And it would have just been quicker and easier to stay with PNG files after all of this. 
So for loading it, I first need to populate my map structure with the data at the start of the resource pack file. And then I need to iterate through my map structure and extract all of the file information, pulling it into memory. This now leaves me with a big pool of memory containing all of my resources, which I can index like a file system. And here where I'm loading the resources, I can see the comments of the stages that I had to go through. But the critical thing here is we're loading an atlas, in this case, which requires a sprite, and it's getting that sprite from this file path here, which is the file path on my local hard drive, but it's not reading it from my local hard drive, it's reading it from this resource pack instead. All of this effort meant that the entire game was compressed into a zip file that was 18 megabytes in size, which contained just two files, the executable and the data file. When you uncompress this zip, this expands to about 250 megabytes for the fast loading of all of the assets. I've only a few things left to show now, but the most technically complex one is what happens when you use a Javid YouTuber token. Here we can see clearly the atlas has changed to provide console-based graphics, but we see arrows in the background indicating the direction to the next significant thing to collect. Of course, there is pathfinding going on here. The code to work out the path planning was cut and paste directly from my Path Planning 2 wave propagation video, where you can see we've got a binary array filled with obstacles and space, and we want to get from one location to the other, one being the player and the other being the target object, and we can work out the field of flow from one object to the other, and it's this field which I visualise using up, down, left and right arrows in the Saving Sedit game. All of this code occurs in the Calculate Flow Map function which is a direct lift from that video. But it's applied to this Javid layer, which is a third layer behind both the scene and the collectibles. I should point out that the support for an external joypad was not created by me, it was created by a discorder called Zix. And the joypad support only works on Windows, I'm afraid, even though the rest of the game will compile and run on Linux. However, this is a nice little utility file, and I'll include this and all of the source code to this project on the GitHub. And so that's a very quick code review of the game Saving Sedit that I created for OLC Code Jam 2018. I couldn't win, but it was just a bit of fun, and I was quite pleased with what I could achieve in a couple of afternoons. Here I've got a, a much larger level, you can see that by the mini-map being twice the size um, than the one you've seen in the rest of this video. So these maps take about 45 minutes to complete, particularly if you're trying to do them 100%. The minimap was sort of an afterthought, uh, because I realised it's very easy to get lost in this game, because everything looks quite similar. In fact, the minimap becomes essential to know which areas you've already covered. There are other little game decisions I decided to make too. For example, your player can't jump any higher than any one cell in the labyrinth, so you can't just jump up there, you've always got to wall jump off of the surface. Uh, and I, I like this effect, uh, because it does require quite a bit of skill to do that, and if you want to play the game at speed, uh, you need to be very fluid in your motions, and think quite quickly, because you've only got a very small window in order to do that double jump. As you can see, I'm not doing it very successfully up this column, and that's because I'm tired, it's late, and I'm playing with a keyboard. I enjoyed putting this project together, and I think one day I would like to continue it and, and sort out a few of the little bugs and quirks. Uh, so it's quite easy for you to get stuck when you start mining your own blocks, uh, particularly when the flow algorithm wants to send you one way and you can't access the block because you can't jump to it, or you've removed the block that you need to jump off. So there are some ways to make the game fairly terminal. Also on these larger maps they end up being quite empty, so perhaps I would bias the number of drops uh, depending on the map size. Clearly there's a lot of tongue-in-cheek remarks going on with members of the One Lone Coder community on the Discord. Uh, so I really encourage you to join in on the Discord and have a bit of a laugh with us. We quite like um, bantering about each other's code. Even though I'll be putting the source on the GitHub, I won't be putting all of the assets and resources on the GitHub. Uh, instead you can download the full game from the links below from the itch.io website. I'll probably modify it slightly just to fix one bug which stops it running on certain 64-bit systems. So if you have a problem, uh, there'll be two versions of the executable in the download file, one for 32 bits, one for 64-bit systems. I'd be really keen to see on the Discord if any of you can beat some other people's times. 
Naturally, I encourage you to go to the Discord and have a look at the code and examine it for yourself. It's very much in the state that it was at the end of the jam, so it's not nice and tidy. It's got bugs in it, uh, it's got comments which are misleading, and it's got features that aren't even used. But that's the beauty of the jam. It just allows you to be free from having to write production level code. You can just be creative and enjoy yourself. And if you've enjoyed this video, a thumbs up please. Have a think about subscribing, come for a chat on the Discord, and I'll see you next time. Take care.